You're listening to Crazy Shit in Real Estate. You'll be amazed at all these wild but true situations that others have found themselves in. Because on this show, you'll hear uncensored, unbelievable stories from the world of real estate. I'm Lee Brown. Let's dive right in. I'm Lee Brown. This is Crazy Shit in Real Estate. And today, we are going to look off into the future, which is actually happening right now. You're going to be fascinated by the information information that Doug Hayden has to share today. Frankly, I took a whole page full of notes and I think you might do the same thing. So sit down and enjoy this conversation. I'll see you on the other side. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? You ready for Christmas? Nope. <laughs> Me either. I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> we just drag all the boxes into the house out of the garage. Well, we pull all the Thanksgiving ones back in and pull out the Christmas. No, Halloween. It's Halloween. So we have Thanksgiving before Halloween, right? So, You're further along than we are. We have a tree in the house with no lights on it, but two ornaments that were given as gifts so far this <laughs> year and <laughs> need to come out. But, you know, it'll happen. <laughs> yeah, that's where we're at. So that's what you have kids for. So <laughs> right, well, my from college on Tuesday. So I'm kind of thinking if we don't decorate, it looks like we were thoughtfully waiting for her to get here, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But well, we waited. It was hard, but we waited. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Well, let's just start off with the easy stuff. Tell my audience who Doug is, where you're located. What do you do in and around the real estate space? Okay. So I'm going to go back almost 25 years. And then, yeah, I'm old. I'm old, Lee. I'm like gray hair. I should be retired. I should be thinking about retirement. No, but instead, I'm actually right in the midst of a startup. And it's in a very interesting space. And we'll dive into that. But I started the residential career actually coming out of a commercial space. So wow. my wife had actually gotten a residential license. And by the way, I'm in Calgary, so Calgary, Alberta. And oddly enough, my wife's an American out of Wichita, Kansas. Anyway, that's a whole other story. We got married. Actually, I met her in Vegas. And then, yeah, that's a whole met other... a Wichita girl in Vegas and then took her to Calgary, not far from Lake Louise. Well, I, was, I, I, a win. I was in Toronto at the time doing work in Las Vegas for some hotels. So... And, <laughs> Yeah, I have a technology background. So I used to run data centers. And then anyway, I have a technology business development background. And so I wound up coming back to Calgary from this. This is after Kim and I got married and spent some time in Toronto um, and then came here uh, to Calgary. And she was kind of casting around looking for something to do. So she got into residential real estate. I was doing business development for a company. I could work anywhere. So way back then, I could still work anywhere. right? And I chose Calgary to come back because it's my home. And then I wound up working for a company that did console systems and like NASA. They literally did all NASA's control rooms. So that's what they did. So that was sort of what I was doing, business development. And then I got a job at a company. So I went from there into another business development role at a company called Smed. And they built out raised floors. This is going into real estate, okay? So it's just a long story. So we used to build out a raised floor system that you could incorporate all the cables. So you could have a clear run of office. And then we come in, everything's prefabricated, just do a beautiful office, just stunning offices. I mean, the clients were like, Lucent Technologies, Simple like Lucent. HP, yeah, compact computers, right? Like that's, that's like old home week. <laughs> oh yeah, I go back, man. I go way back. Now, the um, young people don't know what those are, Doug. When I was a stock, yeah. I was selling, <laughs> and that was like the best stock we had in the nineties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, Carly Fiorino was, I believe, somehow in both companies. Like uh, she. Out the OO yeah. of one, maybe, and then CFO I, the next, and that's CFO moved up. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, I even worked with Apple, right? So I watched Steve Jobs go from starting, then he went to next, then he went back to Apple, then he started Pixar. Like, anyway, so just crazy stuff, right? So that's what happens when you get gray hair. But anyway, you're doing raised floors, you're doing cool commercial things. <laughs> yes, thank you for bringing me back, right? Keep me tethered, Lee. So uh, I will go off on tangents. Anyway, so we're doing that, but to do this properly, because commercial space, a lot of the times they will have something called a TI dollar, a tenant improvement dollar in commercial. So we would tie that in. So I basically would work with the realtors that represented or the brokers that represented the building, the building owner, and we represented the client. So I had full CCIM designation, the whole nine yards, and I got it in record time. I got CCIM in just over a year. Right. And that's actually a pretty crazy program. So long story short, that's what I was doing. 
guess who our, our biggest clients were? Dot com companies. 80% of our book was dot com companies. This is in the late 90s. Well, you know what happened in before, before pets.com. Was pets.com one of your clients? Pets, yes. Pets. No, pets.com was not. WebMD was, right? So and thanks we, to WebMD, we all have cancer. <laughs> yes. That's the first thing. Yes, you have cancer, right? <laughs> so yeah, so we did all those offices and making bank and anyway, then dot com blows up. Then we right on top of that, then you've get 9-11. So the whole book of business dried up. It was gone, mass layoffs. But because I was doing commercial, because you basically in Alberta, if you get commercial, you have to have residential first. So I already had a residential. Kim was doing actually quite well in residential. So we just decided to work together. Believe me, the first five years, you could do a whole series on husbands and wives in real estate, right? It takes a long time to get into a cadence where you trust each other and you do this, I'll do that, right? And I'm a marketing nut. So I will blow the budget and then some on marketing. Even my company today, they keep slapping my hands. So then we started doing residential. And so this has gone back now, 2002, I started doing residential. And so we did that for quite a while. We were very successful, hit the top 1% in less than four years at our company, which was Royal Page, And that was over 10,000 agents Canada wide. And we were in the top 1%, like I said, within four years. So very successful husband and wife team. And we're very community focused. Uh, Kim's still, you know, her, very, very community focused in real estate. So we're kind of trucking along there. And then here's what's interesting. We left Royal Page because I wanted to buy into the brokerage and the owner of Royal Page didn't want anything to do with that particular franchise. So we just started casting around. We went with a smaller brokerage at the time. Just as we went in, within a year or two, they wanted to expand and look for a franchise. Weird coincidence or call it whatever you want. So Glenn Stafford of EXP is just starting up EXP. We run into him. And then through our broker, Willie Hip, we're the first Canadian EXP office. And Kim and I were actually the very first Icon agents. Oh. Uh, yeah, in Canada. So well, do that. Let me, let me interject there. For the consumers yeah. that are watching this, yeah. EXP is one of the big brands in real estate. The icon agents are the ones who have the high levels of production and success. And so we'll just leave it with that and then carry on. Yeah. So we're always at high achievers, right? So we just sort of lucked into that. Honestly, that was lucky. That had nothing to do with anything else. We were both just too lazy. It wouldn't matter who. It just happened to be EXP, so, which was in our favor for all kinds of reasons. So... Pre-COVID, I was getting itchy again. Residential real estate's okay, but you know, it's all-consuming. Not that starting a company isn't all-consuming, but I was just, honestly, I was tired and bored of residential real estate. Not that you couldn't make a very good living at it. It wasn't challenging at all for me. It was just too repetitive. And people like us, right? Like we're very likable people. We're honest. We had a solid reputation, like rock solid. I mean, I still get referrals to this day, right? So I'm just like, no, I have to do that. So, you know, pass it on. Anyway, so I'm trying to make this a long story short, but where this wound up was prior to COVID, I was getting itchy again. I wanted to go back into commercial real estate, but couldn't find an opportunity because commercial real estate is very much like residential. It takes a long time to build up a reputation and get all those networks going and everything else. But if you go back to my history, when I said that I was working for this company to do these interiors, that never left me. And it was always the, it made the most sense because you basically did all your construction off site and it saves on labor and everything else. Well, you could never do residential in that space because it just costs too much. Well, along comes COVID and lo and behold, 30% of the office space now in the United States is vacant and it's going to get higher. Buildings are going into receivership on record numbers, office buildings, mass record numbers. Banks are holding a lot of it. They won't even tell you that it's in distress because they don't want to be the next Silicon Valley bank, right? So there's a lot of regional banks holding a lot of office building debt. So we use that as an inflection or an opportunity point. So we literally just started a company within the last year and a bit that just focuses on converting empty office buildings into residence. Oh, nice. So that's what we're doing. And everything's built offsite. So I brought all my experience in business development to bring partners together. So we don't actually have factories our partners have the factories. We just integrate and direct how that should look and be made for adaptation in office space. 
and we were taking off. Like we're literally putting out like one or two bids a week right now for jobs and it just keeps growing. GSA in the US has a couple of buildings in Chicago. They want to repurpose and they either call it repositioning the asset, repurposing the asset or converting the asset. Whichever way you look at it, almost everybody's heading towards let's change these office spaces to residential. I mean, it's a huge conversation, especially, of course, in the large urban markets where there's more commercial space, but there's differences from market to market based on permits and the regulatory burden that you would encounter trying to transfer something from a commercial use to a residential use. And so for the normal people that are somehow watching the show because you're addicted to real estate, (laughs) <laughs> Just know that the biggest hurdle we run into on in almost every angle of real estate is at the local political level where you have to deal with planning and zoning committees and city council members who may have zero exposure to real estate. They just read one headline somewhere. So then we have to jump through hoops to create more housing. And if we're thinking about what the biggest issue is in housing at the end of 2023 when we're recording this, It is a supply issue. It is not a demand issue. So we're trying to figure out how to create a lot of different kinds of supply, which is the interesting part about what you're doing. It's not creating the picket fence, two and a half kid, dog, house, Cape Cotter neighborhood thing. It is creating a different kind of housing model altogether to fit a different consumer's needs. So saying all of that, would you agree that that's the biggest hurdle you face in doing these projects is the zoning and the permitting piece outside of the actual, I mean, the labor and the supplies, I think you could probably manage, but how do you get past your locals who don't? So you did sort of hit it on the head there. It is certainly one of the key aspects to converting. It's the biggest drag. There's no question. Now, what's interesting, the reason we decided to take this step was, and actually this is going to sound even more strange, Calgary is considered the leader DM, which is a German media outlet, just did a piece on converting because they're starting to convert in Germany as well, right? And also in England. But it's interesting because the only city that they mentioned that had the best conversion program in North America was Calgary. Now, the most successful cities right now tend to be Philadelphia, Washington, New York, and Calgary. Those are the kind of the four that are really standing out in North America that are doing the conversions. Each one of those, the municipalities are on board with converting. And I'll tell you why. There's three big reasons that stand out. So one, you have the hollowing out of the core, right? You can see it in San Francisco, probably the most damaged city by people leaving office buildings. And by the way, the one city that is the hardest to do anything in, right? We can go into that at a later date, but you're exactly right. So the reason that Calgary is so critical is the municipality here said, hey, we can do a couple of things really well here. One, We can help these building owners convert to residential if we get out of the way. So if you want to convert, they drew a line around the core of the city where most office buildings are. And they said any office building that wants to convert to residential can do it without going through a reclassification of the property. It's automatically reclassified. It can be commercial office or it can be residential. And what do they call that zone? Is it called like the repurposing zone? Does it have a cute little kitschy name that they use at city council? They actually do, and I should know this, but it's not the re. Every re- political re- has a little kitschy name now. You are like you're hot today, like right on the money. I just don't know what it is, and it's probably got an acronym to boot. But it is the most successful program, and to date, seventeen applications are in. It's an oversubscribed program. It's very successful. But here's what it really did at the end of the day: it reignited the city core and. So what they do is they write you a check for $75 a square foot upon conversion. Okay, so, so as soon it, as you get, it's not a tax credit. It's a straight grant. It's a straight grant. bingo. And you, you so, no, it's a grant. It's a TI. It's a tenant improvement. So what that really is, it's basically, they figured it's probably somewhere between 24 and 36 months of tax off of that building, off of residential. Well, you know darn well, after three years, Now it's going to be generating tax revenue. But what it did in the meantime, it revitalized the core of the city. So you've got more and more people now living in the core, not just working, but they're living. So they stay there. So now businesses are coming back. And in Calgary, the west side of the city was the most affected because it's the oldest office buildings. And by the way, that's what we see. Almost all the office buildings being converted tend to be built 50s, 60s, 70s. Some to, into well, the that's 80s. Good. They're probably the cool buildings then, and the young people like the cool factor of the mid-century 
modern. So you could say it's a mid-century building, Shazam. Yeah. And then we preserved the character. Oh, the ones in Chicago, I mean, they're pre-World War II. They're beautiful. And they're just being used as warehouses, right? So, yeah, so it's amazing what's going on just in terms of that. But you're right, it's the municipalities. Now, here's the other interesting thing. So that kind of TI thing, the White House just released a program which it's funding that goes into HUD, only municipalities can qualify for it. It's $45 billion of a part of its transportation infrastructure money, but it's considered to kind of help with that. Long story short, it's $45 billion released to municipalities for converting unused office space to residential. Part of that has to be affordable housing. So I think you're going to see this whole area, if you will, or market, or we call it a kind of a market inflection point, but you're going to see this whole conversion for municipalities take off because there's not a single municipality that has empty office space that's going to want to lose out on that kind of funding. It solves so many problems. It revitalizes the core, right? A lot of these distressed buildings, the owners go, you know what, maybe we're better off leveling the building because we won't have to pay any taxes if we take the building out. It's just a tax on the land. But if you look at what that causes just in terms of ecological damage, because you take it like all that concrete took a lot of effort to put together. And concrete is actually one of the least green substances to create on the planet, right? So if you can save a concrete structure and repurpose it, they call them ESG points, right? But you get all kinds of points for doing that. So there's a lot to unpack here, but it's just a smart way to take an old building and repurpose it. And housing is seems to be the best one. And yes, it does tend to attract younger people because you're in a city core, right? So we'll say, you know, the ESG points movement, that's pure evil. Let's just call that what it is. But the reality of saving an old building is great because when you take down that old building, in addition to dealing with the concrete, a lot of those older buildings have galvanized or lead pipes in them. They have asbestos in them. They have lead-based paint. They've got a little cocktail of environmental issues. And so when you disturb all those things, one of the things people forget about asbestos in specific, it's only a problem when you disturb it because then it can be ingested. And so if you're able to leave it alone or even encapsulate it, you can keep it from becoming an environmental issue and save the building, which saves the concrete. And plus, it's kind of a cool factor. And I'll keep mentioning that again, because the architecture of today does not look like the architecture of the 50s. And that's really good for our cities to have a variety of architectural styles in them, because that keeps life interesting. And there should always be some beauty and interesting things. If you are remotely awake, then you know that we are heading into some really tricky economic times. We have home buyers that have put the kibosh on buying We have sellers who have found out suddenly their houses aren't dipped in 14 karat gold. And as a realtor, you are still trying to keep up with the business you have and trying to answer questions in the meantime, while also managing sky high fuel cost at the pump. Never fear because my new video course is coming out right now and it's called how to dominate during a recession. I've been a realtor for 22 years. My business went up every year during the great recession and it's all because of education This course is four modules. There might even be some bonus content for you. The price is $199. I am delighted to bring this out as quickly as possible because friends, there's no time like the present to make sure our neighbors are stronger and we protect the American dream. Click on this link, www.dominatethisrecession.com and I'll see you there. Now back to this amazing content. So with that being said, I love the concept. And one thing a lot of realtors need to be paying attention to is that there will be more empty commercial space in many of our urban centers over the next couple of years because many of the commercial loans are coming due. And with the increase in interest rates, they may just not be something that could be restructured because they're vacant. So the loan applications just don't work. So this becomes even more important. And my question is, are you working with the successes you've seen in Calgary, DC, and Philadelphia to make that something that's a packageable program to take to another municipality and show them how to do it. So perhaps you take it to, uh, what's the city that might need it? Let's just say Detroit, because Detroit has always its own set of real estate challenges. And you could say, I'm the commercial guy who can show you how to tap into this federal money Here's how these cities have done it. Who is the doing the roadshow for that? Is that you or is there somebody that, out there? 
pursuing it. So that's myself. So we actually have a media spend going on right now with BizNow, their real estate, commercial real estate online entity, and The Real Deal, which is they're out of New York, right? So we actually have a media buy with them as well. So we were actually just in Miami at that conference and connected with a couple of partners there that we'll be working with. But if you look at our company structure, we have two key people in place right now. One, Eric Lieberman, he's out of Los Angeles. He's done permitting and applications for commercial real estate for over 30 years in the state of California. So he knows how to get projects approved, right? And then he deals and if directly you can with get it approved well. in California, you can do it anyway. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. New York and California, right? So both coasts. And then the other gentleman that we've got on is we call our distressed assets acquisition team. And we're building out a team right now to do exactly what you said, which is build the capital stack to acquire or work with owners of these buildings or the banks that hold the buildings now. There is over $1.5 trillion in commercial office debt. Commercial debt itself is like $5 trillion, right? But there's $1.5 trillion in office debt alone that's about to reset in less than 30 months. So imagine if you're an owner of a building, nobody's signing a release, you're watching your building slowly vacate, you bought it in 2017 for $200 million. you'll be lucky lucky if you could get 50, you're probably only going to get 35 million. What are you going to do? You're going to take the keys and you're going to give them back to the bank. That's what's going on. The banks, on the other hand, some are releasing the distressed assets. Actually, I think there's one in St. Louis that sort of set a record, like 200 million before COVID. And I think, believe it sold for $12 million on market, right? So yeah, that's sort of the outlier, but that gives you an idea. So if you can buy a distressed asset like that, you can make a business case to convert it then in New York and other places. So there's all kinds of factors that are at play and we're building out analytics that we can show people. So, hey, if you're in Washington, here's the rent in the core for a one bedroom and a two bedroom. And by the way, we actually can scan the floor plates, build out a digital twin and show everybody not only what the building's going to look like, but what you're going to get for rent, what your ROI is. Because we're doing prefabricated, here's the difference. All the conversions to date have been done with conventional construction. So as you go through the permitting process and then the reclassification process, that can take a year to 24 months, typically. Okay. So let's say the cities are going to get on board. Let's say you can get that down to 18 months, right? But then you've got the build process. Now you got to go into the building, right? Carve it out, get it ready. But you've probably done that before you're going to build. But anyway, you still have to do it. Then you've got to build. So now you've got drywall coming in. You've got electricians coming in. You've got plumbers. Everybody's coming. We can take all of that and build it off site. So while you're getting the building ready, you're exactly right. Take out all the old stuff, upgrade to new air conditioning systems, HVAC systems, get the elevators refreshed. By the way, nice thing about office buildings, you get a freight elevator for free and they're designed to carry more people quicker. You do not wait for an elevator in a conversion. You don't. They're there. So not like I'm some other buildings. Same perk. Yeah, because some of the lenders go, well, who wants to live in an old office building? Well, you'd be surprised because the conversions in New York, and there's been quite a number of them in the financial district, they are fully rented out by the time the units are ready. So anyway, where I was going with this, we actually take that second part, the part that would take another 18 months to complete. We can actually do that in 50% less time. We actually think we can get it down to close to 35%. How do you do conversion in a box? Is it the framing? Is it a kit for the one or two bedrooms or the drywall? How do you make it a kit? It's, we have videos. If anybody's interested, okay, I'll send you. Your website. <laughs> yeah, I'll send, okay, seeing is believing, right? But it's hard to explain. Basically, everything is assembled. So everything from walls to ceiling, a lot of everything is built in. So when we drop off, we call them cassettes. So let's say a bathroom module, right, is a cassette. It comes and it's just plugged in, right? So all the plumbing is there for the bathroom and everything. It can go up in the freight elevator, right? It's brought into the space, all the walls freight elevator brought into the space. They're stacked versus volumetric. All the plumbing and wiring is typically in. If it's not, it's not hard to get in because you'll have the runs in and everything else. What you're really doing is you're building as much as you can offsite. So you're assembling versus building onsite. And by the way, the minimum product that we offer is built with a fire rated MDF. It's a high performance material. It's so much better than drywall. It looks better. You believe you're actually in a higher end unit. We can do things like foils, and foil is basically a wrap on MDF, it's basically indestructible. Like you really, really have to go at it hard to ruin it. And by the way, most of these conversions are turning into rentals or hospitality. Those are the two prime that we see. 
And we can even do life science. So if somebody wants to do doctor's offices or age in place or anything like that, we can accommodate all of that. And we, the companies that we work with have been doing it for over 20 years. So to answer your question. Absence every, of doing a kit for a medical office or a kit for residential. Web, so that's your- yeah. And here's where it gets even more interesting. The biggest problem with conversions is the fact, remember I was saying that a building might be 60% vacant. So you still have a tenant in there, right? We can actually go in and convert that building with a lot less disruption because you're not building on site, right? You do have to get the mechanical, electric, and plumbing. It's called MEP. You do have to get the MEP ready, but you can do a lot of that work at night and that sort of thing. What we're saying is, and we call it construction without disruption. Basically, we do all the construction off-site and bring everything in and it's assembled off hours because that's most buildings be a, a huge savings on labor too isn't well, it because you're your guys are able to show up at, at a job site and build these and send it 70 70 percent and what's the biggest problem right now getting electricians right fitters and that's one of the biggest problems so and that causes projects to even get extended further out but where i was going was imagine if you could take a building and instead having to kick that tenant out or knock them out or pay to get them out which isn't going to work like they're on a 10-year lease or like that it costs you a fortune you can actually change the stack or the building layout so you can actually do the top and there's a building in dallas right now that's literally going through it the uh, top 10 floors are being converted to condos and the rest will remain office so now we're starting to see the conversion or mixed use of space and we think that that's our strongest market opportunity for the next five years Right, because if I'm that existing yeah. tenant and you're building condos above my office, my workers may just want to live above the office and they'll stay with me longer. So maybe I'll expand my lease. Well, time. and the other one is student housing. So there's some buildings now where the college wants to take like the maybe the bottom five, right? And then student housing above. And we can build all of that. We can do classrooms. We can do all of it, all offsite. Like we can do educational. We can do life sciences. We can do office, like so if somebody still wants office in there, right? And now residential. So all of that is in the mix. And again, so people have to start looking at the building very differently now because now they have the option of, you know, what can I do here? The biggest cost is going to be improving the building's MEP, but there's also a lot of grants to do that because you touched on it, right? You're making the building greener. You're upgrading your HVAC, maybe your windows. There's a lot of grants and funding around converting that. Okay, so, so we actually put that in as a part of our stack. Well, if I'm one stack. of your investors and I'm looking at this and I say, you know, I want to be involved in this. If the cost of a project is the 100%, what percent of an average project could be covered by these grants and the money that's out there to encourage this product? Can I cover half the cost through the grants? Is it? I, did, I don't think you'll get, yeah, a lot of it's going to be loans, like low interest loans and that sort of thing, right? Calgary has by far and away the richest program, okay? And they're yeah, all different. little money up there in Alberta, y'all have an advantage. Yeah, well, we're using it now. But that's also the collapse in oil is what caused the whole thing to start in the first place. So it's definitely an up and down ride. But uh, the city of Boston announced their program and they will give you a 70% tax abatement, right? Seven. So, seven zero. So you only pay 30% of what you normally would for residential, right? And by the way, in New York, just to give you a rough idea, vacant office building might pay like 50000 you know, 60000 a month in taxes, right, for a vacant office building, but, you know, average size, right? So say like a 25-story. If you convert that to residential, it's going to increase taxes to, I think, almost 150000 you know, if you look at what the city gains by that, to answer your question, you can get PACE loans, they're called PACE loans, where the government will give a PACE loan, and that's to convert just the MEP. So that's part of the stack, but it's a mixed bag. Each jurisdiction has its own way of tax abatements or tax advantage, or here's a grant. They're all different. It'll be interesting to see what happens with that White House money. We'll see how municipalities deal with it. Right, just well, I how think the biggest hurdle on that is just going to be education, because uh, my original point, the people that make these decisions aren't always well versed in what you and I are discussing. But yeah. if they understand it and can get the project moving, you could really have some solutions for a variety of price points in the community. Because if there is a rule that a portion of the product has to be available for workforce, that is a desperate need, and a, a lot of especially in the growing markets. Yeah, that can be a work, win for everybody. Yeah, workforce and student housing are huge, huge markets right now. As a matter of fact, in the commercial space, student housing is actually probably right at the top, if not the top, in the second in every market. 
for student housing. So that's actually in Chicago. That's one of the adaptive reuses that's come up. Is, well, Doug, can we do it's student young housing? people are spoiled. I have a freshman in college. <laughs> I think that's what, is that what basements are for? <laughs> The kids in college need to live in a place that has roaches and popcorn ceilings and learn how to appreciate how it can be so then they can work their way up. We're giving them too easy of a start. Uh, oh, that's a different yeah. discussion. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't hold back, Lee. Don't hold back. <laughs> uh, I remember the first place I lived, there was a, yeah. some friends of mine, there was a trailer and there was a hole in the floor because it had rusted out. And if we liked the people coming over, you'd pull the rug away so they could see the hole. And if you didn't like the people, we'd leave the rug there and see if they go through it. I know that sounds mean, but hey, college. Oh, no, I think, I think that was Kim's first car. If I remember getting into it, I well, see the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but at the end of the day, it's residential real estate. Just to give people a rough idea. Okay. So, New York alone is short 500,000 apartments by 2030. 500,000. Okay. And let's point no out, too, that's a variety of needs, too. I think we forget yeah. sometimes talking about the shortage. Most yeah. people envision where they live as what the shortage is, but the shortage is the studio, tiny, inexpensive, and the multi bedroom for a larger multi generational family. So you need this really big diversity of real estate types in all of our marketplaces and real estate price points and different fit and finish. I think that's one of the coolest things about real estate. It's not a commodity. And so we have to always break out that when we say this many units are needed, they've got to be a wider assortment of you for units. It's the Whitman's chocolate need. You need the assorted box because somebody wants the orange cream center and somebody else yeah. wants solid dark chocolate and both are valid. And the biggest one is they say affordable. Now, you know, what's affordable in New York is not what's affordable in Atlanta, right? So you've got varying kind of degrees that you're working with, right? And again, most conversions so far have to be subsidized because again, you're coming out of office, right? So, and it's not the end all be all, it's a solution, right. but it's so massive that from our perspective, and it's funny because originally they say only 5% of the buildings could probably be converted. Then it went to 10, now it's at 30. So what's happening is as experience is being gained, they're going, oh, we can do this or we can do that. I think it's probably going to go close to 50% at the end of the day of these buildings can be converted. That's good news. Yeah. Here's another one. I think office parks are really our biggest opportunity. So I was just in Chicago and there's an old Bell Labs park. It turned into an AT&T campus at one point. This thing's on like a full section of land. And it's like driving into a country club. Like these office parks especially around Chicago area and in New Jersey and around Atlanta, they're massive. They're huge. And they literally look like country clubs, manicured lawns and everything else. They're ideal to put full communities in. They literally have the hub, they have the parking, and then they have all the space around that can be converted into housing or built new. So it's a company out of New Jersey that's actually doing two of these office parks right now. So what they do is they take the center they build up some restaurants and everything in one of the buildings. So they make it like almost like a mall. And then they start to build housing around, right? Parking's already there. Access to highways, roadways, they're always well situated to good transportation. They're just ideal. So and one green space too, because a lot of those have really extensive landscaping and they have a lot they do, of like, built in. So it's a walkways way. and bike paths and it's crazy. You've got a great mix there. They're going to put over 20,000 people in this one office park. 20,000. That's a right? town. Yeah, it is. It's like a little town. So it's just the repurposing. So rather than tearing it up, sometimes you'd have to do that. I mean, in Edmonton, north of us, they took their old municipal airport and that's all being converted to housing, right? So you're just starting to see repurposing of all kinds of things. Like ours is obviously just focused on kind of office. But where we're going, Lee, is that we're already in discussions with, I'm not sure how familiar you are with mass timber. I think timber is beautiful. I love wooden structures. Mass timber is rapidly replacing concrete as the new construction material. And mass timber buildings go up in literally a third the time that a concrete steel structure will. And it's very precise. Now, it's not for all markets, right? Some markets, you closer you get to Lake Florida. But here's what's really crazy. They just put a mass timber building on a shake table in California, so an earthquake table. It was so superior to any other concrete or steel product that it got the highest rating ever 
on a timber shake or on an earthquake shake because the building righted itself as it's it knows as how it's to settled. give. Yeah, it knows how to give and it came back. So whereas the concrete survived and the steel survived, but there was structural integrity issues. So anyway, we have a very clear path as to where we want to go. And we are only focused, by the way, on residential. We're housing. We are just focused on residential because there's just so much going on in that space. And we put all kinds of tech into our environments. So one of the things in the buildings, you know, condos, biggest problem for insurance and everything is water. So each one of our units comes with not only water detection, but water arrest. And it's so intelligent now that it will ask you if you're leaving, or let's say you've left, or it's not detecting motion, you'll get a prompt on your phone. Are you out of your unit, right? Would you like the water shut off? Are you leaving for the weekend? It lasts. So you can actually shut the water off on your phone to your unit. I would put that in the category of super creepy, but also super helpful. You know what? That's what's coming. can be helpful. (laughs) Yeah. But let's say you don't even answer. Let's say you don't care. Or it happens while you're out of the unit. There's sensors all throughout the unit. And it'll detect any water leak. So if two sensors go off, it shuts the water off in the unit, right? Because remember, these are rentals. So if you're the building owner, the last thing you want is somebody that's gone for a week and that happens. But there's also smoke detectors. There's even pest control. All this stuff is automated now, like for the whole building stack. That's not the last thing you want is the renter that's gone for the week. That's the next to last thing. The last thing you want is an angry tenant. Who wants to punish you when they leave by turning on all the faucets and yes. problem because we've seen that before. So let's just say that <laughs> negligence is not as bad as the malicious intent. Can we agree on that? <laughs> yeah, we'll agree on that. And then but even it's, things it's like if somebody leaves an investor, a- though, like as an investor, I'm sitting here thinking, wouldn't that be wonderful to have in all of my rental properties so that I could preserve the neighbor's integrity? I think that's one thing that's forgotten when the water happens because it's just life happens, leaks happen, overflows happen. It's not just the unit that got impacted. It's the person underneath them who's got it coming through the ceilings and the one next door who's got it coming through the baseboards. And you want to preserve the integrity of everybody's living as much as you can. I think there's a scalable impact there of the intrusive, creepy tech. Yeah. And it's not only is it coming, it's here. And it's not expensive. Like Honeywell Residio, if anybody owns you know, their own rental properties, check out Honeywell Residio. It already has all of those things. So anybody can put it in. It's not expensive. And it'd actually save you on insurance. Insurance companies love it when they see, oh, we got an owner that really cares about the property, right? And they're doing what they can to alleviate any potential problems. But it's coming because there's another company that you know I would encourage your audience to check out called SkyX. And they make these really cool receptacles. So you can literally connect a new light fixture once you use a SkyX receptacle with one hand in like two minutes, not even like a minute. So you can interchange light receptacles. Here's the crazy part. They have a hub on these things now that you can talk to whatever you use. You use Amazon, you use Siri, Google, doesn't matter. It will connect to as much as you want to connect to in your home with Bluetooth. So you can walk in and say, well, turn the lights on, turn them red, play the music, like it will recognize when you're in. So you can talk to your house, basically. So the, all that exists today. And it's not overly expensive. No, but it's, it's just nobody's really looked at integrating. It's creepy. I love it. But here's the thing, Lee. If you're a renter and you live off your phone, most of them do, right? Where are you like most likely to hang your hat and stay? If you come into one of our conversions, not only does it look better, it's got a higher end finish automatically because you're using MDF. It has reveals, like just looks stunning, right? And it's not a whole lot extra. It's actually, if you look at the whole compaction, because what I didn't mention was if you can get heads and beds faster, that means your income stream is kicking up. Thousand percent. Right? We actually say, because people go, oh, this is more expensive than drywall. And by the way, drywall, I just hate it. I worked for my grandfather who had a drywall company. I hate drywall and it's been around for way too long, right? It's toxic. It's dirty, right? You don't need it. Anyway. It's a respiratory nightmare. That's a whole different. Oh yeah. And then anyway, so long story short, don't need it. But people are coming into these environments where they're more likely going to stay, right? Like stay longer and be happier and not want to leave. It's an environment where they've programmed it. It walks in, it knows them. They like it. Okay. If you can order, skip the dishes while you're sitting in front of your couch, that's what they want to do. So anyway, all I can say is all that technology exists. We're cognizant of it and we incorporate it because it doesn't cost very much to do. And yet the tenants are happier. They're just happier. And so you have a longer retention rate for your building. And we can even build model suites. 
So that's the other thing. If you're converting a building, especially one if it's going to be partial, we can actually build model suites and put them down in the lobby. So this is what they're going to look like. So people can come in. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'll rent this. I'll sign. So we're doing all of these things. Like I said, five months. That's We're like in our fifth month of business. Okay. So obviously we could nerd out and talk about this. Yeah. So we can't, but <laughs> tell the audience where they can go to learn more about all of these projects that you're doing and follow up with you and figure out what they can do in their markets or reach out to you about a building that needs to have a bid done. What's the best way to fund Doug's crowd? Well, they can contact me directly through email and it's D Hayden, H-A-Y-D-E-N at Arthrito. Because a lot of people say, how do you pronounce that? It's Arthrito.com. By the way, how we got the name was we had to find a name. So I was Googling, how do you translate prefabricated into Greek? Well, it's this freaking long. Okay. It's like too long. So then I said, well, what's modular? Oh, Arthrito. What it means is to join. Okay. Joint joining. Okay. And that's exactly what we do. So anyway, or they can just go to our website, arthrito.com. And for so, those of y'all that are sitting there thinking about the Greek and didn't write it down, don't worry because everything <laughs> is in the show notes for this episode. It's <laughs> very easy for you to click follow and connect with Doug and all these exciting things that are going on because I love this. It's always energizing to find out that there's people who have taken their boredom and used it as a driver to go do new things. And so I'm very glad that you got bored in your real estate life so you go do something fun. Still real estate, just like lots more exciting. I think you should do a show, by the way, if you haven't on technology, house technology, home technology. And that's the other thing. I mean, I have some pieces that have snuck in here and there, but I guess we'll have to find them. Yeah, a lot of companies are working on it. And the other thing I'll just leave with this and appreciate the the audience and the time and your energy. I love you. But the other is that we're going to do a whole series on the future of housing. And we're kicking that off in late January with a webinar. And we're working with BizNow and The Real Deal to put that all together. So we're finding speakers for it right now. So if anybody wants to kind of see what's going on or follow what's going on, I'll get that information to you. But it's called The Future of Housing. And it'll be a two-day webinar in the mornings if anybody wants to check that out. Just send me that information when it's available and we'll push it out to the audience so that anybody who's excited to find out more can go keep yeah. learning. And that's, that's what we do here. So Doug, thank you so much for coming Lee, on Thank you. Giving yeah. me some, some notes. notes. <laughs> yeah, you <gotta> check out now. <laughs> and tell Kim hello. And I hope you guys have a wonderful start to the new year and some very exciting things happen for you. Much appreciated, Lee. Okay. Take care. All right, guys, say something okay. nice in the comments about Doug or something you learned or you're excited about. Make sure you click the subscribe buttons and bells. And most importantly, Come back and visit. We'll see you next time. As always, I am so super thrilled that you joined in for more crazy shit. And if you are a realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular human being who happens to have an unbelievable story that you need to tell the world about, or frankly, you just need to one up the story you just heard, then make sure to DM me on Instagram at Lee Thomas Brown or tweet me at Lee Brown or frankly, any social network where you hang out. I'm there. And if you have some fun, then you totally won't just subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes.